Hi everyone, it's Katie and today I have a bit of a fun video to share with you and I'm really quite excited to make this video. As many of you will know, the Guild Tarot is um, a very special deck to me and the best word that I have heard to describe this deck um, and the relationship that I have with it is that it would be what many people call a soul deck for me. Now, I try not to talk about this deck too much despite its important role in my life because it has been out of print for quite a while. When I first got this deck, um, you could find it on eBay for anywhere to from $50 to $100, which is still a lot of money. But in the past couple of years since I got the deck, um, prices have kind of skyrocketed and become uh, what I would describe as obscene. But lucky for all of us, US Games is reprinting the deck and it is currently available for pre-order on their website. So I'm really excited to finally be able to really kind of talk about this deck in detail without feeling a little bit guilty, without people getting upset with me. Um, and I thought, you know, in preparation for this pre-order, I would just walk you through this fabulous deck. Now there may be small changes between this and the new printing, but I doubt very much that the cards themselves, the images will have changed. Even the book, um, I think the book technically still is in print. I see it often for, you know, 10 or $12 on bookshop websites. So I doubt the book has changed much either. But having said all that, you know, I'm not 100% sure. I'm just making this video to give you a bit of an idea of the Guild Tarot, what to expect, um, what sort of a deck it is, and why I love it so much. So we'll quickly talk about the guidebook. Um, this is written by Elizabeth Josephine Gill, the um, creator, the artist of the deck which is pretty cool. And it's a pretty chunky little book. Um, as you can see, mine's pretty well new. I haven't spent too much time reading it, um, but there is a lot of information in here. And the book is broken down pretty well. Um, and it's very, very thorough. Um, this is the table of contents, just to give you an idea. Um, and as you can see, the Tree of Life. Um, this deck does have a lot of the more traditional occult esoteric stuff going on. Um, which is why I think if you're interested in that stuff, this book could be very, very helpful. Um, and I really like her writing style. It's very easy to read despite being very thorough. Um, and yeah, it definitely does bring a lot of like um, the Kabbalah and stuff like that into it. Um, which is very interesting. Um, however, I've just had a very personal relationship with this deck, so I haven't spent too much time with the guidebook, which is unusual for me. But as you can see, just with the death card, you get a lot of information. With the minor arcana, oh, a lot of information for the mages. With the minor arcana, you get a little less, but it's still a lot. There's a lot in here. Um, and I hope, you know, if you're interested, you can kind of pause it and have a bit of a read. If you are interested, you get a little bit of information about the numerology. Um, so she talks about the sevens and the twos and, um, you know, um, outside of just the individual card meanings, which I think can be helpful. And we do get these little thumbnails of the cards too. I suppose another note that I have on the guidebook is, um, given that it is so heavily, um, you know, based in that Western occultism, Kabbalah sort of stuff, a lot of, um, you know, like the numbers, um, even the suits, they're very gendered, which isn't my favorite thing, but um, you know, I think it's pretty standard for this kind of approach to um, esoteric um, practices and um, systems. So that is something to keep in mind that um, you know, it is very much rooted in those, those sort of systems that um, often are very gendered, for better or for worse. The little white book that you get with the box, you can see mine's cut a little uneven. I love these older style um, books and things. Um, mine is kind of like that, um, glossy paper almost. Um, and obviously you don't get anywhere near as much information as in the larger guidebook, but you do you still get plenty. Um, like we get a bit of information about the structure and the style of the deck. Um, and then the numerology, which again, I think is really cool. And then for each of the cards, we get a bit of information too. Not a huge amount, but I think pretty, a pretty sizable amount for a little white book. Um, all of this stuff does come directly from the larger guidebook, obviously just a select sentence or two to get you going. And we have a description of what's going on and what it symbolizes and then the divinatory meaning. She does also walk through just the numbers, like the numerology um, in here briefly, as she does in the larger guidebook, but obviously um, not quite as thorough, but it is there to get you going, which I think is helpful. And then back to the minor arcana, this is the sort of information you can expect to get. 
And as you can see, the cards in this deck, all the minor arcana, have a title to go along with them. So that is the little white book. Now the backing of this deck is the Tree of Life, um, because this deck does rely very heavily on that Kabbalah Tree of Life. Um, like she does associate the numbers with um, the Sephiroth um, pretty strongly. And at the bottom here it says, and I see men as trees walking. And we have the four suit symbols up the top here. So it's an interesting backing. Um, we have, you know, the black and white pillar. It's, yeah, very cool. Very different to a lot of the stuff we see today. Um, now, I have been told by some people that this is a little bit more of a Thoth deck than it is a Rider Waite Smith. I know very little about Thoth, to be perfectly honest. Um, so I don't know how accurate that is. Um, but I certainly see, although um, this I would describe as a semi illustrated um, Pips deck. Um, some of the um, minor arcana are very reminiscent of the Rider Waite Smith, so I'm not entirely sure how true that is. I'm more of a Rider Waite Smith reader, but I don't have a problem with this deck, obviously. It's my favourite deck, so just something to keep in mind. This isn't so much a review, I just wanted to share my favourite deck with you um, as it's being reprinted. I love this Empress. I love all of the cards, really, to be perfectly honest. It is definitely a little bit old school um, with the colours that are used and everything. Um, it was published in 1990, the year that I was born, so I'm assuming, you know, created in the 80s. Um, Joe Gill has only ever um, participated in the creation of one other deck, and that is the Servants of the Light. Um, she only did the major arcana for that deck, and I did have it at one point, primarily because I love this deck so much. I love the lovers and the juxtaposition between the lovers and the devil card. I shared a little bit about this on Instagram once, and I think I've spoken about it here before as well. Um, I won't go into too much detail. Um, perhaps I'll, I might in another video if you guys are interested, but I just think that is so brilliant. I love it. Um, there's a lot of details in this deck like that that I just think are really, really well thought out. You can tell that this wasn't just a you know, that Joe Elizabeth Josephine Gill put a lot of thought and effort into this beautiful deck. Um, but as I was saying, the Servants of the Light, she only contributed to the majors. She did the artwork for the major arcana. Um, and I've forgotten the name of the woman who did the book and was kind of like the, the creator behind the deck. And then somebody else did the minor arcana. I love these colors. So as much as I loved the um, the artwork in those major arcana that Joe did, um, I just didn't I didn't connect with that deck, and um, I moved it on. Love the colours in this, and we have um, the elements and the suits as well. <laughs> Hanged man is very colourful. There's just so much I like about this deck. Um, the artwork's very clear, um, which is important for me given that, you know, I struggle to see cards that are like overly detailed. Um, so the imagery is very clear, so I can see all the bits that I wanna see. I love this temperance. Um, it just shows, um, you know, temperance as like a very active process of movement and creation. Um, it's not a passive one, which I really like. Um, I forget what I was saying now. I know this, is, this isn't this is really a review. This isn't a structured video. Just a sharing one. So I hope you'll forgive the rather rambly, non-linear progression of my sharing. Love this star. And we have her reflection in here too. A lot of it is rather traditional, especially in the majors. It gets a little bit less um, obviously recognizable in the minor arcana, I suppose. Love these colors. 
in the world. This is kind of rather alien to me, which I think is kind of cool. And the colors, I just love this kind of like galaxy behind. Then we get into the miners, of course, and as I mentioned, we do have keywords or titles for every card, which, you know, some people will like, some people won't. And I suppose on paper, I probably wouldn't have thought I would have liked it. But I love the way that, you know, it's kind of like incorporated into the image. It's not just like printed at the bottom. And this is what I mean by semi, a semi scene. Like it's not really scenic, but it's also not Marseille pips. There's stuff going on to help, you know, to really, it does illustrate the meaning. It just doesn't do it so much scenically. So this is what I call like semi illustrated um, pips. And I love this. Love how we're kind of like above the clouds, above everything else, and there's just kind of like quiet and a blossoming there that can happen. And loss. The colors in this deck are very striking, um, very bold. Um, and I know some people won't, you know, that's it's a, a personal taste thing. Um, and I suppose in so many ways, I maybe I wouldn't think on paper that this would be a deck for me because I tend to prefer prettier colors and I mean the majors certainly offer that but the minors perhaps less so but there's something really visceral about this even though it's really quite minimalist you know all we have is the eight done in an interesting way with our keyword conflict and the way that the red is kind of swirling it looks like blood or something like that and then these swords kind of all coming at each other in a really chaotic sort of way um, you know, to me, that really kind of evokes a lot of, a lot of thoughts and emotions. Um, I think the way that she's done everything is very, very purposeful and very, very effective. Desolation. I love this card. The Ten of Swords is one of my favorite cards to begin with, but I really like how she's done this. And then our um, court cards. They are Princess, Prince, Queen and King. Um, and I really like them and we do have a keyword for them and they're not, you know how some court cards will have more like a title, um, so like a description of a person. So perhaps, you know, like, I don't know, I can't even think of any right now. Um, but it might be like a soldier or an architect, like it's more a description of like a role. These are, these remain more keywords, um, more titles, which is interesting. And the king. I love the aces in this deck. Um, they just feel really elemental and potent, I suppose. Um, they feel really powerful in their simplicity. They kind of just really do kind of boil down to the core of the element, which I think is really cool. And I mean, obviously you can see that the, you know, the ace, the A and the number in the Minor Arcana, they're very front and center, which makes the deck when you lay it out in a larger spread very easy to read. Now this is one example of many um, where this definitely reminds me of the Rider Waite Smith. This one less so. Now perhaps this is one example of where, um, you know, we do have the element of fire in here, so you can put two and two together and work out, if you're not familiar with the deck, that this would be a one suit card. But, you know, when I very first got this deck, I think, you know, with this pointy um, and then like the gray, um, you know, the deck wasn't in order. And I think, you know, I was a bit unsure as to whether this was the swords or the wand simply because I wasn't familiar with the deck and many decks do swap the elements. Um, so there are a couple of cards like that where if you're not 100 percent familiar with it, it might take you a little getting used to. But I mean, we do have kind of the elemental thing going on here. And of course, we have the keyword, too. But that's just something to keep in mind. Um, the one suit certainly is very fiery. We have plenty of that. I love how we have Endeavor and then we have like an arrow pointing off and all this energy moving forward. Victory. I really do like the keywords too. I think, um, I'm not sure if this is where people get the more Thoth connection, perhaps. Are these fairly Thothy? <laughs> Thothy. Um, keywords perhaps, 
I'm not sure, but regardless, I really have liked all of these keywords. They really work for me. Um, and they connect with the imagery as well as my own understanding of the card. Now here is another one where, um, you know, once you get used to it, it's fine. But these are the eight ones as opposed to, you know, discs. Um, it does come together to make the eight um, as a ones. Um, you know, once you know that, it's obvious. But um, if you're kind of getting used to the deck or the deck arrives to you all shuffled up, it might be, you know, you kind of... A little, a little tiny bit of a trip up maybe for some people. I'm not sure. I love this. Like so, so simple. Such simple execution, but so effective. Oppression. And just, doesn't this feel oppressive? This card feels so oppressive. I think she's done such a great job. I love this princess. She looks like a phoenix. In human form aspiration for the the prince I was gonna say the knight then same difference really we have our queen and our king with his lion his innovation love this ace of cups I think it's so beautiful <laughs> yes I know keyword love love how we have the cup here to symbolize and then the lotus and this water but then the two faces in the cup kind of meeting but also as one in the cup sharing of the sharing from the same cup experiencing the same same emotion together as love i think it's lovely joy I feel like there's an overflow and a sharing and the connection and joy that comes from that love this kind of dripping it's very powerful and the colors you can see how like the shifting colors some are so bright and vibrant others are kind of murky dull it's interesting and you know depending on when I'm working with this deck and you know I said I work with it really quite intuitively um, different things will come up for me I love this card so much you know, this isn't this isn't a deck that I like study. You know, even though I I'm, I think it certainly lends itself to that. Um, I think there's a lot in here. Um, Elizabeth Josephine Gills definitely put so much intention and thought into this deck. You know, it's very Kabbalah heavy, um, so it definitely could lend itself to being a very very strong study deck. Um, but for whatever reason. I just haven't felt the need or desire to do that with this deck. It's just a really heartfelt, soul-based connection for me. It's a spiritual and psychological experience, not a mental one as such. Um, and I don't really want to want to challenge that. I don't want to push that. I mean, perhaps one day I'll feel called to. I'll feel that my relationship has shifted. But for now, you know, as I said, it's my favorite deck it's the most special deck in my collection to me um and i'm you know why would you kind of want to alter a relationship such as that now this suit is basically discs and it's a, perhaps a little less obvious in terms of the imagery than some of these other ones basically anything round is classed as a disc some of these you know here we have like a the earth Others are more um, just orbs, some are wheels. Um, so here we have, you know, kind of the two circles. I remember the first time I saw this, I thought maybe this was wands because of the branch, but no, this is discs, the two of discs, unity. And you know, these two roses in the circle there. Um, I love these colors. I think this is such a pretty card. Some of these cards, despite this deck, you know, in so many ways being quite um, bold and brash almost, you know, with the colors, some of these cards are just really, really pretty too. Yain, so you know our three, our three coins. That one's pretty obvious. Order. We have our four concentric circles here. Really like this card too. I think it provides that structure without, and the the solidity of the four of pentacles or discs or whatever, without um the kind of um value judgment or moral judgment either way on whether that's a good or a bad thing um you know which i think some decks can kind of lean one way or the other which is fine but i think this is kind of an effective way of um neutralizing that i suppose to a degree adaption 
well-being. So this is quite a different take, I suppose, in some ways. Delay, I love this. Skill, another one I really like. Love this checkerboard. Prudence. Prosperity. It is funny how we have, you know, so much Tree of Life imagery and then in the card that is most Tree of Life heavy in, you know, the Rider Waite Smith, that's kind of removed in this deck. So that's interesting, but, you know, just, just something I noticed. Um, so here, you know, the disc is this wheel, um, you know, so, I mean, once you know that, it's fine, but I do remember the first time I picked this up, I'm like, uh, that looks like a very earthy card, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. You know, but yeah, that's just, um, you know, because I was kind of looking for pentacles or something because I knew very little about this deck. But, you know, we have the wheels and then the queen and the king are more holding these little orbs. But, you know, she does look very earthy. And he's holding the globe. So that is a little run through of the Guild Tarot. Now, as I said, this isn't a review as such because... I work with this deck in a way that is not very structured and it's very, very personal. So, you know, I don't really feel like I can give specific examples um, of, you know, readings and how it's so amazing or whatever. And I also don't really feel like I can walk through the structure of the deck because that's not how I work with it. Um, suffice it to say that this is the most incredible, personal, amazing deck that I've ever worked with for me. Um, it's so important to me that I've never read with anyone else with it, um, because it's just such a personal moving experience. And I think I've said before that this really feels like my higher self in a deck. Like it feels like a part of my soul belongs to this deck or is somehow attached to this deck. Um, and I've said before how, you know, when I try to describe how important this deck is for me or why it's important, I end up using language and terms and ideas that don't necessarily align intellectually with what I think or believe about the world, but it is just how I feel and experience this deck. Just before I go, I figured I will do a quick chat about these two cards and why I love them so much, because I know I'm going to get questions anyway. Um, so I think I'll just start by reading out um, what I wrote on Instagram. Gosh, like two years ago, I think. Now this was for the Tarot Addicts Challenge, um, where we were to pick our favourite um, card, each card in the Major Arcana. And for the lovers, I picked this, lovers, but mostly because of its connection to the Devil card in the deck. Um, and I wrote, this is not so much my favourite lovers card, but these two cards together, the lovers and the Devil card from the Guild Tarot, depict an incredible juxtaposition, perhaps my favourite in any deck. In the lovers, the woman looks up to the angel, but is held onto and pulled down by her masculine counterpart. The choice is to follow her desire for spiritual enlightenment, or to instead allow the temptations of the earthly realm to keep her ignorant. The second option offers a wonderful experience in its own right, of course, but is it the right choice for her right now? In the devil card, we see the result of the woman having chosen the man and the earthly realm in the lovers. While he seems rather happy with his wealth and earthly knowledge, she knows there is more to life than the material. She tries in vain to reach out to him. Both can leave, but he doesn't want to, and she feels she can't abandon him or her commitment to him. I love that the devil in this card is literally salivating over the man's obsession with material wealth and success. He doesn't need to scare or control this man with force. He need only distract him from his true purpose and higher good. While he is blind and complicit in his own enslavement, the woman sees this clearly and recognises the disempowerment inherent in this reality. So that is one example of, you know, the kind of the layers and the depth and the intention that has gone into this deck and the sorts of things that you can discover and find if you work with this deck. This is one kind of very clear example and one of my favourites, um, but there's many, many examples um, of connection and just intention and purpose and just, just things to learn from this beautiful deck. So I just, I love that juxtaposition, um, how we kind of see, um, you know, a decision being made and then the results, um, what happens, um, the unfolding. I think it's very interestingly done and very effectively done and is one example of why I just, I love this deck so very much. So I think before we finish up, I'll just um, draw a card and just give you a few thoughts 
put a few of my thoughts on the card. Um, you know, it's not so much a reading. Um, I'm not really going to work with the book. Um, it's just, I don't know, just draw a card and tell you what I think about it really and what it means to me right now. Um, because that's kind of just how I work with this deck. I mean, I have kind of flipped through the book in the past. I especially enjoyed the bits about just the numerology. Um, and how numerology comes into this deck. But other than that, I haven't del delved into it too much. I mean, I think with those keywords, um, you know, you can kind of, you know, work through the deck on your own pretty pretty easily, I think. The cards are a little bit more um, square than most. Um, it's not as tall, um, but they're, you know, other than that, they're mostly a similar size to what we're used to. Well the nine of discs prudence i love how in this car we basically like have stepping stones so it kind of looks like you know a journey um towards some kind of outcome and we kind of start with this darker and it moves to light so whether that's you know something starting out difficult and getting easier or perhaps more representative of our own evolution um and enlightenment growth it also seems to be crossing over water. Um, I mean, depending on, you know, when you draw this, you might see it differently, but it does look like water to me. Um, so that often means some kind of like transition, um, some kind of movement from, you know, one realm to the next or one experience to the next. Um, and the nines, I remember the book talking about the nines being very much about independence. Um, so to me, this kind of indicates like a journey um, from, you know, whether it's hardship to something easier um, or one of growth and enlightenment um, that ultimately leads to us being more independent. And, you know, in order to, um, you know, take these steps one by one um, and not to fall in the river and to fall into the depths of, you know, whatever lies underneath. Um, you know, there's a level of caution that needs to be taken. Um, and I think this really speaks to the need to take one step at a time. Um, you know, it's not about jumping from, you know, right here up to the front. Um, we need to take that transition of the greys. Um, we need to go through the entire process. You know, we need to kind of exercise some judgment in that. Um, a bit of common sense comes into it. And, you know, the wisdom that is kind of required of um, knowing when we're ready to move on from one stage to the next, um, but not doing so too soon or too rashly. So apologies if this, you know, wasn't as much of a thorough review as I would normally do. Um, I just don't feel like I can really offer that because of the way in which I work with this deck. Um, but I do hope this has given you a little bit of an insight into, you know, what you can expect with this deck, a bit of a walkthrough of the cards so you can kind of have a good look at them. Um, and, you know, I would love to hear what you guys think. If you already have this deck, what do you think of it? Um, and let me know if you are planning on pre-ordering it or ordering it. I know I certainly am planning on getting a backup copy because it is just one of those decks that I feel like I need. I need a backup copy. But that is all from me for now. And until next time, so much love. Bye.